ignored by the mainstream media. Conveniently. Dan Carlin, Common Sense. For many years on this program, we would talk about things we thought were going on, and there would be these big, long discussions and arguments and disagreements and what have you about whether or not those things were really going on. And so it's very difficult to build on top of what some people feel is reality if other people are able to take the you know, opposing side and say, well, that's not reality. I, I, I don't buy your premise. Hence, we won't go any farther you know, down the road of thinking, what does this mean? You know, what, what can we divine from this understanding about the reality as we can now agree is reality? So the advantage of the last program we did was sort of consolidating information that had been becoming increasingly available for many years, certainly in the post-9-11 world. We all understand what's going on now, okay, in terms of the surveillance and the monitoring and the extent of it and how deep it goes. And while we might not have tons of details about, you know, everything, everybody has a much better understanding of the reality of things now. So we can now use this agreement about the state of reality to build farther, you know, out on the branch of speculation and discussion and motivations and what's really going on. It's always my hope, you know, as everybody hopes, that past experience helps gain them a little extra credibility that, you know, hopefully I won't, as I said in the last program, it was so great to be able to throw off the tinfoil hat that some of you must have thought I always wore. Um, I hope that with this current program, we don't just put the tinfoil hat back on for those same people. But I want to talk a little bit about what we know teaches us about what's really probably going on um, and, and how you know these things. I mean, in the last program, we tried to point out that, you know, being able to predict the state of things is not a Nostradamus or crystal ball oriented sort of prophecy. It simply requires careful reading of the news sources out there, listening to the people who've been in the situations, you know, and who are telling us what those situations are, and then making sure that, you know, person A or whistleblower A's comments agree with whistleblower B's comments. It's noticing the little things that are slipped into larger pieces of legislation that give you clues as to what's really going on. And understand that when it comes to the kind of changes in the laws that would raise red flags in the media or amongst the population, they are often slipped into bigger bills, very complex, long bills about subjects that are often getting a lot of attention. So, for example, maybe you'll have a health care bill and the media is paying huge attention and all the newspapers are writing about these health care changes and everything. And then they throw in a little teeny bit, a few clauses or something about something that's almost totally unrelated, slides right in under the radar because people aren't talking about things like surveillance in a health care bill or what have you. That's something that if you want to get a, a beginning, you know, we compared it in the last show to a jigsaw puzzle, trying to figure out what is going on in terms of reality behind the scenes often involves, you know, putting together pieces of a puzzle and then looking at it with pieces missing and see if you can divine what the picture that would eventually emerge if you were able to find all the missing pieces is in the puzzle. And you know, what I think differentiates uh, some people from conspiracy theorists out there, there are conspiracy theorists out there who are, who are quite good at putting pieces of the puzzle together too, but they jump to conclusions about what the picture is, you know, once the puzzle's put together. I think part of what you have to do if you want to be credible on this is try to, as much as possible, uh, stay grounded in reality. You know, not, not assume that you can say, okay, I see the pieces of the puzzle coming together, therefore the Illuminati are running the world. I mean, you need to to look at, this is where history comes in, you need to look at history as sort of something that can ground you. And we have many history people who listen to the program. You know this already. This is not for you. But I often get asked by people, and these things are often debated in historical societies amongst professors and everything, what's the value of history? You know, what does history teach us? Can we really learn anything? And the general public often misconstrues what can be learned from history. But what you can learn from history is what's normal. In other words, if something was normal and somebody suggests that it's either continuing today or some version of it is continuing today, that's something that history helps you, you know, put into a proper context. So, for example, if you look at the news stories, if you listen to the whistleblowers, if you, you know, pay attention to past happenings, for lack of a better word, you can begin to construct what's probably happening here. Um... 
So let's talk a little bit about that because I think it involves something that dovetails. You know, we told you in the last program, and everybody who listens to the show already knows this, that the whole surveillance, monitoring, spying, civil liberties question is about, you know, 20% of everything we've ever talked about on the Common Sense Show. It's a huge pillar of the program. But another huge pillar of the program is the question of reform. We always tell you, how do you get from A to C, right? B is the actual mechanism that leads to reform. A is the desire and the plans for reform. C is reform. How do you, how do you jump that barrier B from A to C? And many of us, many of you, yours truly, I've talked about this on many shows too, we get disheartened sometimes because it's becoming harder and harder to find avenues for reform. And every time you think, okay, this may be a way to untie the Gordian knot, these new mechanisms that people spot, you know, get shut down. The courts are a perfect example of um, entities that have done a good job shutting down avenues of reform. People think, aha, we'll get some campaign finance going. And, you know, you know people sign petitions and things get handled and then states enact laws and, and it gets to the Supreme Court and gets shut down. So more and more what we have here is a system where avenues that might conceivably exist to fix things get shut down. And what this starts to do, ladies and gentlemen, is build up the sense of hopelessness and the sense of agitation and the pressure. There was a speech that John F. Kennedy gave in the early 1960s, and this speech was directed, I don't know if you could call it in a mocking way, but it was certainly with a sense of superiority towards those societies on the planet in the early 1960s that didn't have avenues for people who felt differently than their governments or you know their philosophy allowed. The Cold War communist governments, for example, these governments that were totalitarian, that didn't allow for people to have avenues to change things, right? In other words, if you don't believe in a Leninist, Marxist view of the world and that your society should be built on those kinds of concepts, you're out of luck. And not only are you out of luck in those societies and there is no avenue for you to change things, you are an enemy of the state for trying to, right? And John F. Kennedy so famously said in that speech that those societies that make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. The fabric of their societies. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. And he's talking, ladies and gentlemen, about safety valves. If there's one thing that societies that are run on the will of the people, whether you're talking about straight-up democracies or republics, or in our case, something that's often called a democratic republic, you have these safety valves built into it. The safety valves are avenues toward change. And it keeps the society from exploding because there are ways for you to exercise your agitation if you're upset about the state of things. I mean, the standard thing is voting, right? The sheer fact that you can vote opens up avenues towards reform. You don't like what candidate A is saying, you vote for candidate B. Already, that's more of a safety valve than you're going to get in the old Soviet Union, right? But as we've spoken about many times in this show, that safety valve is not the safety valve it used to be. There are some out there who may claim that that safety valve was never as much of a safety valve as we always pretended it was, but it certainly isn't now. You only have to look at the current occupant in the White House to see how much you got what you voted for, right? That person, President Obama, ran on a transformative change agenda and got into the White House. And on these issues we're discussing most of all, these huge constitutional questions, and he's a constitutional law scholar, right? That was considered to be one of the advantages of electing a guy like that in a time when a constitutional law scholar is just what we needed in government. And he has not only continued the policies he promised to overturn, he has deepened them. He has taken the Gordian knot that he promised to loosen, and he has tightened it, okay? So what does that do to the safety valve that helps the system release pressure? helps it deal with the agitation, helps it deal with the dis